Church, take your Bible in hand, please, and open to the book of Ecclesiastes again. For another few weeks, we'll be finishing this book uh, before long. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We've been looking at a series of sermons entitled, A Life Worth Living. Do you have one? You say, well, I, I think I do. Well, Solomon has been challenging our thoughts in the world's view, especially on what the good life is. And how the good life that's lived only with this life in mind leads to vanity after vanity after vanity. Playing the part of the devil's advocate, if you will, uh, causing us to think about life that is lived only in the living of these days. Uh, he's come time and again to vanity. He has elevated wisdom before. He's going to do it again. But in this chapter, as he looks at wisdom, he talks about how wisdom affects us, even our physical look. But then how it is limited in the living of these days to give the answers that only God and eternity makes sense. So this morning as we begin, would you stand with me? We're going to read off of the monitor the second part of verse 12 and then verse 13 together. And then we'll go back and take up the chapter. Read it out loud with me if you would. I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him, but it will not be well with the wicked, nor will He prolong His days, which are as a shadow, because He does not fear before God. I chose that for our reading because it's the second time that he's going to say out of three in his text. All, most all the time, all Solomon has is questions. Questions, questions. But for the second time, he says, but I know this. You can nail this down. Now, Father, we stand under the authority of your word, and we ask you by your Holy Spirit who authored it to teach us, to help us understand not only its truth, but, Father, that you might apply it to our lives individually, to our church corporately. Father, that the end result would be we would think, act, live more like Jesus. Father, to that end, we want to bring glory and honor to you from our lives. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would. Again, we're moving closer to the end of the book. And Solomon, again, is talking about wisdom. Of course, it's wisdom that he's referring to, that wisdom that's under the sun. It's wisdom that focuses on the living of these days as though there's no eternity, as though there's no God to be accountable to, as though there's no life after. I, I said it again Sunday it's, or Friday. It's not a new thing that I've said here with you. It may be new to you, but years ago I was challenged with the idea to, to pick a spot on the wall and look at that spot. And let that spot, let's say that one spot represents your life. And then start there and go around the room with a line and continue to go time and time again. It never ends. That line goes on and on, and that line represents eternity. And the question was asked, which makes more sense, to live for the dot or to live for the line? This life and the living of our days, it seems to be all-consuming. It has a way Satan uses the living of these days to get our eyes uh, focused on the next step right in front of us. We get very myopic. We, we, get, uh, we close down our view. But it's when Jesus says for us as Christians, set your mind on things above. Where Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Live our lives knowing there is a God, there is an eternity, and that the living of these days are not divorced from Him or that. Wisdom, with all of its uh, benefit, and it has plenty in the living of these days, has its greatest application when wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord in our walk with Him. Well, back in the first of the chapter, I want to look at the first five verses together under the title of Wisdom and Its Living Picture. Well, wisdom affects our life. We're going to see it even affects our, our, our physical appearance. Look what he says beginning in verse 1. Who is like a wise man and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine and the sternness of his face is changed. There he's talking about, first of all, wisdom's power. It has an effect on us. It has the ability to make a great difference in our life. He asks the question when he says, um, who is like a wise man or who knows the interpretation? What he's saying is, there's no comparison to wisdom. Who's like that? You can't compare anything else in the living of these days to a man, a woman, boy, or girl who are walking in the wisdom of God that comes by the Word of God and the Spirit of God to our life that we've received it and applied it. He said, who can compare to that person? 
Man, he said, he said they, they, they understand, they interpret things, and they know how to live. I say it often. There's not anything that will enable you to understand and interpret life like the Word of God. Uh, we, Solomon is dealing with all this book. We're going to see it again. Uh, we're going to reference it today. We're going to deal with it again next week for the last and final time. But he's going to say over and again, the, the thing that throws so many people are the anomaly, anomalies of life. The paradoxes. I see the wicked, it seems, to prosper. We see the, the righteous seem to suffer. And, and if there's, God is good, why is there evil? But nobody ever asks the question, if there's no God, why is there so much good? The idea that these uh, paradoxes aren't addressed by God who created man for his glory and his honor, but who live in a, an environment, not that God created, but that sin caused the consequence to be. If you sin, you shall surely die. And they did, and we are. As though those things aren't there. Wisdom impacts us. We know interpretations. Notice, it causes his face to shine. And the sternness of a face is changed. A man who has wisdom and understands life from God's perspective. We don't walk around life all stern and downcast. It talks about the shining of the face. The Bible says three times, it talks about God's face, the shining face of the Lord. May God cause His face to shine upon you. The Bible says that Moses, when he came down from the mountain, his whole face shone with the glory of God. And it was, he had to cover it. It was so powerful to the lives of those who saw it. The Bible says the face of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he came down and his face shone with the glory, the glory of God. And that's what shining normally means. The Shekinah glory of God means that bright and brilliant and shining. What he's saying is a man who walks in wisdom, his face shows the glory of God in his life and on his life when he walks in wisdom. In verse 2, he talks about its practical use. He turns here in verse 2 down through uh, verse 9, and he talks about a situation that uh, is understood in a king, um, or maybe if you work for somebody that's got a king complex. <laughs> uh, it could be applied several ways. But uh, Solomon, uh, I think, understands it well. He talks about its practical use. Look at verse 2. I say, keep the king's command commandment for the sake of of your oath to God. He says, whether it's a literal king or somebody with a king complex, he says, keep the command. The first imperative is to keep the king's command for the sake of your oath to God. Now, if we went back to 2 Chronicles, when Solomon became king, all of the, all of the rulers and nobles came to Solomon and pledged their oath of allegiance. But we even have today, say, well, Brother Tony, that, we don't have kings. No, we have Romans 13. For the church, for us as Christians, says God ordained government. And we're to honor and respect that role that God has created government for. Even when it's not godly government, the role of government itself was created by God. And that even wicked leadership was a judgment of God on Israel for their sin. The government plays a place that is not immune from God or His impact or His direction. He says... Verse 3 through 5, it's protection. It talks about wisdom protects us. Look in verse 3, it begins with uh, two more imperatives. Do not be hasty to go from His presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for He does whatever He pleases. What He's simply saying is, number one, He says, don't, don't rush away in haste. Don't, don't huff out of the boss's office. He says, next, don't stand there and plead your case. Don't argue with the guy. Not as, especially when His power is absolute. He says there's protection. Look what he says in verse 4. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who's going to say to him, why are you doing? Three rhetorical questions in this uh, first section uh, pose the teaching that comes by instruction and by proverb. And so he asks the question, he says, uh, who's going to say to him, you can't do that. You can't do that. Oh, yes, he can. <laughs> Practical wisdom gives you the understanding of how to protect, be protected when we live in a world even where there is abuse of power. Look at verse 5. He who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful, and a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. It is a parallel proverb. Both 
sections of the proverb parallel one another. The first part, he says, when you keep the command, you don't experience anything harmful. Wisdom keeps you out of harm's way. Because, look at the second part of the proverb, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Both when and how to say something that needs to be said. Doesn't mean you never say anything. Doesn't mean you ever take a stand. But wisdom will give you the practical protection of when and how to do it. With a king or a king complex. Either one. He talks about in verses 3 through 5 the protection. But then in verses 6 through 9 he talks about the limited power that wisdom has. uh, Especially in the face of trouble. Look at verse 6 through 9. Because for every matter, the word matter is the word trouble, for every troublesome event, there is a time and judgment, though the misery of a man's increases greatly, for he does not know what will happen or who can tell when it will occur. No one, verse 8, has power over the spirit to retain the spirit, and no one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war, and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. All this I have seen and applied my heart to every work and it is done under the sun. And there is a time which one man rules over another to his own hurt. He talks about that there's providence in problems. Verse 6 and 7 deals with those matters in those times of trouble. He says, for every matter, for every trouble, there is a time and a judgment. We saw that in the poem on time in chapter 3 verse 1. There's a time for everything. We've said it before that God created both the day and of joy and the day of adversity, the day of gladness and the day of difficulty. Both of those days God created. And both of those in God's time can be profitable to those who walk in wisdom and understand that God is sovereign over our lives and that I don't have to fear and that I don't have to uh, take the the place to set it right or to make it right. Verse 7, He does not know what will happen and who can tell Him when it will come. There's the third of the hypothetical questions. Because we don't know the trouble that's going to come to us, verse 6, and we don't know the time that's going to come. So wisdom says that we trust God in those times of the providence of God in times of problems. But wisdom can't figure it out. Wisdom can't tell you why the difficulty comes, why the trouble's in your life. Wisdom, earthly wisdom doesn't provide that. Nor does earthly wisdom tell you when and uh, what that bad day is going to come. I think about time and days in the life of people in the Bible as I read it. Uh, My mind is drawn especially to uh, the people who've crossed over after 40 years of wilderness in the wandering. They're getting ready to to go into the promised land. And Joshua's getting them ready to go. They say, well, you know, uh, we can't do that. And God says, okay, I tell you what, I'm sorry I said Joshua in the time of Moses. Uh, they said, okay, you're gonna, everybody that's 20 year old and up is going to die in the wilderness. 20 below is going to go into the promised land. They said, oh, we didn't, we didn't understand it like that. You didn't, you didn't tell us that. We didn't know it was a big decision. We thought it was just a, you know, decision. But now that you explain it like that, I'm ready to go. God said, no. God's will is set within a parameter of time. And if we waste away the parameter of time, then we will have to settle for at best God's permissive will, but not His perfect will. God was told He had to get 100% participation in His companies, or in His division of His companies, uh, support of uh, whatever the thing is that you do at work. Never been able to get 100%. There's one guy who wouldn't do it. The boss said, let me talk to him. He came in, he walked out, he signed up for his United Way gifts and decided he'd give it. The guy went to it, the the, the man he'd been trying for years, he said, you never would sign up. He said, no. He said, nobody ever explained it to me like he did. He said, what did he tell you? He said, you either do it or I'll fire you. (laughs) Nobody ever explained it to me like him. You see, life's decisions don't always come with pink neon lights saying important Big deal, important, big deal. Wisdom of this world does not give us an insight on what trouble is coming or when it's going to happen. So to walk with God day by day, day by day, day by day is the wisdom of God for His children. To be prepared for that day whenever it comes. Well, 
powerless in death. Look at verse 8. No one has the power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, and no one has the power in the day of death. That is, uh, there is no release from that war, and wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. It's a play on the word authority, on the word power, I should say. No one has the power over the Spirit to retain it. Wisdom doesn't give you the ability to say to your spirit at death, no, don't leave the body, stay here. You've got no say in it. When that time comes, the wisdom of this life has no impact on it. Neither, he says, uh, and uh, no one has the power on the day of death. Uh, there's no release from that war. The two words there are, are different words. It's a play on words. And it's the idea of both power and authority. We have that in the New Testament. We have the understanding that power sometimes mean I have the power to stop that car by lifting it up, which, okay, we don't have. Or the policeman has the power to stop that car by raising his hand because he has authority. What the Bible says is that the wisdom of this world gives you neither power or authority over your own spirit. Isn't it funny how men, women, boys, and girls think that they are in control of their life? I'm the captain of my ship. I'm in control of my destiny. I've got it all. You don't even have power, control over your next breath or heartbeat. It's a fool's lie. Anyone to say, I've got control. You're not. You don't. But we have the opportunity through Christ to know the one that does and the one that is. He says, there is no release from that war. Isn't that a poetic way to talk? We talk about fighting for our life. In that fight for life, you, wisdom of this world gives you no advantage in the war of fighting for your life. What's Solomon saying? He's saying wisdom with all of its benefits. Worldly wisdom is not adequate to get you out of this life alive. It's not enough. It's good. It's better. It's better. All of verse of chapter 7, when he asks at the end of verse uh, 6, what is good? All of chapter 7 is, let me tell you more good. Let me tell you better. More good we call better. Let me tell you what's better. Let me tell you what's better. Let me tell you what's better. And wisdom is better than foolishness. But worldly wisdom, the wisdom of this life, still is limited in what it can do and what it prepares us for. Until that wisdom in fear of God brings us to Him. Well, even verse 9, it closes the section about the power abused. Uh, and he talks about in verse 9, he says, All things I've seen, maybe he's even saying he's done it. He is king, remember, of all of the ancient world. I've applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. If you've ever lived in a situation where somebody was able to abuse their power and you've experienced that, you know the pain of that. And it happens. But Solomon says, know this. Might does not make right, is the way we say it. Might does not make right. And that person, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in government, whether it's in a home, that person who takes a position and abuses somebody else with it, that that abuse is not lost on the keeper of the accurate record keepers of the account. And he says he does it to his own hurt. That person who in abusing is thinking he's hurting others is, but that hurt's temporary. That hurt's going to stop. That hurt's going to change. But the hurt that's coming to him for that abuse, not so. Not so. He says, I've seen it. I've done it. It's there. Well, in, ver in the, the third section in verses 10 through 15, he talks about again what I call life's paradoxes. Uh, and wisdom gives us the ability to live with paradoxes without being overwhelmed by them. I mean, I, I don't know how many people have walked out of the, any thought of God over the existence of evil in the world. That because there's a good God and evil, that's a paradox. Well, it is unless you understand where the evil come from. Where did it, by one man came sin, and by sin came death. Nobody wants to lay sin at God's feet. God didn't create sin. We know that sin came from man. But the consequences of sin, Satan is forever trying to lay at God's feet and say, you see here, because there's a good God and evil, that means he must not be. And it's absolutely ridiculous. His wisdom gives us the ability to understand and interpret we know where Paradoxes come from. 
Man, when he had no bit and no reason, no rationale for disobeying God, chose to do so. Well, why didn't God make it where he couldn't choose? You want to be a robot? Do you want your children to automatically love you and have to love you and, and give you uh, affection? No, God created us like him. That when we choose to love, then it means something. When we choose to love, it has value. God created us with a will, and man exercised that will to disobey God. To disobey God. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. One of the greatest parental tools you can have with your children. When they disobey you, they're not loving you. Don't tell me you love me and disobey me. That's not true. If you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey me. In this matter of paradoxes, he talks about the existence of injustice. Look at verse 10 and 11. Uh, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed, executed speedily. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, stopped, I skipped over verse 10. Start at verse 10. Then I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had done this. This also is vanity. Solomon says, look, uh, I see the wicked who's buried, and when he talks about who had come and go, it's the idea of in and out of the holy place. So he's talking about one of two things. There's a lot, uh, centuries of debate on which it means. It doesn't matter. Both of them make perfect sense. When he says in and out of a holy place, maybe he's talking about a hypocritical life. Hypocritical life. You know wicked people go to church. Did you know that? I didn't surprise nobody, did I? Wicked people go to church. And sometimes that wicked person being in church causes a seeker to look at that and think he's here and this is what church is about. And Satan uses the presence of wicked in the church to say to the person that God's trying to reach, see there, it's not real. It's not real. He says he goes in and out and lives this hypocritical life. And you think with him insulting God like that, God just kill him dead. The other may simply be, he said, I saw him died and buried. And I think probably what fits the text better is they took him to the church and buried him out of the church while he lived a wicked life. A lot of wicked men and women have been buried out of church. And even somebody stand and say they went to heaven. When everybody that knows him knows that ain't true. If it takes the forgiveness and redemption of God and a transformed life by the love of Jesus to prepare you for heaven, I don't see where that woman boy or girl had it. He says it's a paradox. The wicked seem to be there. Now, I want you to hold your finger there, and I want you to turn back to Psalms chapter 38. I, I'm going to call your attention. We're, we're about to get into it a little further, but I want us to have seen it as we get ready to do it. All of chapter 37 of the book of Psalms is how he was confused, how David sees the calamity over the wicked and the righteous paradoxes like we're talking about here. But I want you to look at me with just some verses, just parts of verses very quick. Look at the first part of verse 2. For the wicked shall soon be cut down. Look at verse 9 and 10. For evildoers shall be cut off. Verse 10. For yet little while the wicked shall be no more. Look at verse 20. But the wicked shall perish. Like the splendor of the meadows shall vanish. In smoke they shall vanish away. Look at verse 22. For those blessed by him will inherit the earth. But... Those cursed by him shall be cut off. Look again down in verse 34. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. Last time, verse 38. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. You see, we look at the wicked today, and we don't see their end. So David says in Psalm, Asaph says in Psalm 70. Man, I, I thought the wicked got ahead. It looked to me like everywhere I looked, the wicked seemed to be prospering and having it their own way. One of the greatest, greatest confusions for young poor children is to see drug dealers and, and pimps and all these guys uh, have money and have things that money can buy and be confused at thinking that the wicked are the ones who get ahead. That man, if you could get ahead and get over on somebody and don't, you're an idiot. Because they've seen only what looks to be, what looks to be with the human eye, advantage. Asaph went into the temple and he said, Then I considered their end. And I've hunted at night on the Tennessee River, moss-covered rocks, where one, one slippery step would send you into the water. And Asaph says in Psalm 70, They walked through life on slippery rocks. 
at any minute the next step could send them in not the Tennessee River but to an eternity in hell forever away from God. The wicked shall be cut off. Well, let's go back to our text in chapter 8. He says, I see the wicked buried and they come and go. The city where they have done all this is forgotten. And the fact that their wickedness is forgotten seems to be a vanity. Same with verse 11. Because the sinners against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. He said uh, the wicked do wrong and everybody knows it, but the sinners doesn't come right then. Whether it's God or government, sometimes that, that's confusing. But the end result, Solomon at diagnosis is this. The, the heart of the young see that. And the, the fact that execution is delayed emboldens their heart to the fullest to do evil. But you see, that's the short-sightedness of foolishness. You see, that guy that's living it up and got money and whatever at, that uh, seems to attract the eye of the young, nobody's interviewing him. Nobody's talking to him when he's on death row or when he's spending his life in prison in, in, in the most debauched uh, dark hole of the world and going through all of that. Nobody's talking to him. Hey, buddy, how's it now? How's it now? When he's killed in prison or killed in his sin. Nobody, nobody interviews the guy. You can't interview the dead. But Solomon gives us the insight and says, Listen, when we live with paradoxes, we have to, wisdom helps us understand that injustice exists. It exists. In verses 12 and 13, he brings us to iniquity's end. We've already looked at, but I want to take the thought up again. He says in verse 12, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. This is what's called 12 and 13, are called inverted parallelisms. He talked about the wicked, then he shifts in the second part to talk about the good. Did you notice it? It will be well, it will be well with the righteous. Look at verse 13. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. It's not going to be well. Solomon says, wisdom of this world that stops at death, that stops at the grave, gives us no preparation to deal with the paradoxes of life and the presence of evil in the world. It makes this life completely vain. No difference. You got a lot of money, don't matter, you're going to die. And the person you leave it to might be a fool and squander it. You work hard to get it, your sweat meant something to you, don't mean a thing at death, because whoever inherits it may not care a thing about it. And if life is lived under the sun, with this life at the end at the grave, then this life is vain and empty and has only the momentary joys of enjoying what God has given you because that is His gift, verse 15. That is, I commend to you joy. I commend joy. But I want to add to Solomon's wisdom the teachings of Jesus. If you would turn back, if you would, to chapter 25 of the book of Matthew. Jesus in three or four parables, we're going to reference them all before we leave because I feel we must. He's going to reference this thing about uh, at the time when finally the Holy God of Heaven brings into account the living of these days. I say it this way. I've said it this way for years. It makes sense to me. God is the accurate record keeper of the accounts. I'm not to keep score. Love keeps no score. It's not my job. But Holy God is the accurate record keeper of the accounts. Every evil done to you, God will never misplace or forget. Every righteous thing you do for God's glory and God's good will never be forgotten or ever go unrewarded. He is the holy, exact record keeper of the accounts. And He is the one who in a holy justice will make every record right. He will balance every book of every life in His time. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 
verse 33 and 34. He's talking about the, right, the uh, judgment of the nations and how the righteous nations are on his right and the wicked are on his left. Look at verse 33. He will set the sheep, the righteous, on his right hand, but the goats, the wicked, on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, notice, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Hear that word, come and receive what you've inherited. Come and get it. It's been waiting on you. I've been preparing it for you all these days. Come and get it. Come on. But I want you to notice what he says to the wicked. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice that contrast. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit. Depart from me, you curse, into the everlasting fire. A few years ago, uh, five or ten years ago now, there was a guy, a pastor who pastored a big church who wrote a book, Love Wins. And he declared in that book that one day hell was going to be emptied and everybody was going to go to heaven. I got all kinds of problems with that, but let me tell you the two that matter most. That man has no idea of God's holiness. Hell is not an embarrassment on the holiness of God. It's a hallelujah, praise God, rejoicing to the holiness of God. God is holy God, and He will not have His, nobody will thumb their nose at holy God and walk away from Him. It also absolutely diminishes the blood and words of Jesus. Every time Jesus says life, He says everlasting. Every time He says hell, He says everlasting. Hell is as long as heaven, not to God's shame, but to God's glory. That holiness of God, that the blood of Jesus mattered. If there ever comes a time when hell is emptied without having received and responded to the blood of Jesus, Jesus' blood would be meaningless and at the very least contrite. But the Bible says that there is for the righteous a come and receive, inherit eternal life. Never ends, never ceases, never diminishes. Never has a bad day. It's always God's glory to His people. But to the curse, He says, depart. Holiness says to sinfulness, you've got to go. You've got to leave. You can't, holy God can't receive sinfulness in His presence. When that's as holy as touched by that which is unholy, that which is holy becomes unclean. It's a principle of Leviticus and all, Leviticus and all through the Word of God. Holy God cannot allow sin in His presence. He would cease to be holy if He did. That's why when our sin was placed on the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, who came in the flesh of man, the Father had to turn His back and He had to cry out, My God! My God! Why has He forsaken me? Holy God, when our sin was placed on Christ, had to turn His back and Christ had to experience a distance. You think after that, God is sometimes just going to say to all those, Well, you know, time's up. Time's up. God's holiness will never cease to be holy and sin will never cease to be sin unless and only by the blood of Jesus is it atoned. It is, as we repent of our sin and believe on Him, our sin is atoned, it is forgiven, and it is remembered no more. And it is taken from us and God's, Christ's righteousness is placed on us and then we are made fit and acceptable to holy God. Come and inherit. Come. 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 The end of Revelation ends, the last few verses. Come. The Spirit and the bride say, come. Come to the Father. He's made a way for sinful men like me and you to come through the blood of His Son. Come on. Come on. But don't delay. You don't know. Wisdom of this world doesn't tell you how much more days you've got. Well, Brother Tony, I feel great. I'm young and strong. I've done the funeral of many young strong men. I've done the funeral of many young women, even children and youth. Wisdom of this world doesn't give us Insight on the trouble we're going to receive or the time it's going to come. Jesus says there's inequities in this life, but they have an end. They're coming to an end. Holy God's going to deal with it. The wicked aren't getting ahead. The wicked aren't winning. It may look to you, but that just means our wisdom is really poor. Our insight has not been uplifted and refocused by the Word of God. Because when it is, we understand and interpret life from God's perspective. And we see clearly, it don't pay. It don't pay. Well, 
Life's plan, verse 16 and 17, we're done. He says in verse 16, When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on the earth, even though one sees no sleep, then I saw the work of God that a man cannot find it out. Look at verse 16. He talks about in life's pain, his endeavors. He threw his heart into it. He said, man, I gave all my heart. I didn't sleep day or night. I tried to buy wisdom to understand and figure out all of this stuff. Notice that word business. He said, I wanted to understand the business of God, the workings and the dealings of God. And he said, with all of my endeavor, verse 17 gives the answer he found after he gave his heart and did it day and night. Look at verse 17. Three times then I saw all the work of God that a man cannot find it out. Out of the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it out. Number two. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will, third time, not be able to find it out. Now, the first rhetorical question that we looked at in our text is in verse 1. Who can compare to the wise man? Who, can, who, can, who is like a wise man? Solomon answers in verse 17. Nobody or nothing. You can't find it out. You can't find it out. Wisdom of this world is beneficial. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We saw in chapter 7 that, that worship of God is done in fear and reverence. Wisdom and worship start with a, a reverence of God and a fear that God of God, a reverential fear of God, who He is. But as we look at the teaching of Jesus and we think about the living of these days, and all that we face. Jesus used a couple other parables I want to close with. In chapter 25, we looked at the righteous nations, and He says, come and inherit it. But also again, in John chapter 5, Jesus talks about the fact that there's coming a day where there's two resurrections. I've heard of the wicked being cremated and one of their ashes spread from a plain or taken to a high mountain and thrown to the wind so that their ashes could be scattered with the idea that if their ashes are scattered, God can't bring them back together. Isn't that hilarious? All God's got to do is speak to that windy crater and say, by the way, go bring that old guy back. There he comes. But in John chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave shall hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus used a parable of two kinds of fish, that the kingdom of God is like a fisherman who throws a net. He said, It's like a net that's dragged and cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it is full, they draw to the shore and they sit down and they gather the good into the vessels, but the through the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Just one more. Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a field where there's wheat that's grown that the Farmer planted the wheat, and that's Christians, but his enemy came and in that same soil sowed the seeds of weeds, tares, weeds. And at first, when they begin to sprout, they look identical. You can't tell them apart. But as they begin to grow, it doesn't take much growth to re begin to recognize the difference of a wheat stalk and a tear or weed. And in that picture, Jesus says this, the kingdom of heaven, I'm sorry, angels will gather out of all that offend and practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But Tony, why all this? Well, maybe you're here today or somebody that's listening today thinks you can live without accountability. No, there's coming a resurrection day of the just and the unjust. Maybe you feel like you can swim around in humanity's ocean and get away. No, there's a net of all of the fish of the ocean of God that's going to be caught. Maybe you feel like you can hang out in church or exist alongside God's people and get in on that account. No, God's not confused by that. There's a wheat and a tear. There's coming a day when God will righteously judge and separate. The living of this wisdom, the living of this wisdom is not adequate for the living of these days. But God gives us in His Word His answer. He says, fear God and love Him. We're going to see it in the closing words of the book. Solomon sum it all up with that very thing. Christ's saving grace is offered. 
He's going to say, separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But to the righteous, he says, come and inherit what Christ procured, procured for you on Calvary. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't in any way gain it by your actions. You received it as a gift from God or you don't have it. But you can receive it and come and inherit. Have paradoxes been throwing you? Somebody in your life want to somehow shame you and your faith in God because of paradoxes and the presence of evil and when God is good? Don't, 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 get, don't get caught up in that net. Just to share with them the truth of God's Word. You're, you're, you're drawing the line. You know, you know what I learned in math? I didn't learn a lot, but I did learn this. You can't do the total until you draw the line. As long as numbers are being added, it's not over yet. You see, you got people wanting to add up stuff and make conclusions and come to some totals when God hadn't drawn a line yet. One day God's going to draw the line and it's not going to add up well for the wicked. So don't add it up till the line's drawn. In the 70s, a very renowned gospel singer, blessed me a lot, named Andre Crouch, wrote a song and recorded it. And he understood what Solomon was saying. And just one verse in the stanza of the song goes like this. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions about tomorrow. Who hasn't? There's been times I've not known right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come only to make me strong. And the chorus says, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on His Word. Anomalies aren't new. But listen to me. Neither are they confusing to the Word of God or the people of God with the wisdom of God. We know why they're here. We know how they got here. And we know one day they're all going to be made right. And we're living in that time with God's grace and God's mercy and God's goodness to give us wisdom to live and to know how to live in the midst of an evil, fallen world where the gospel is the only hope and the only help to those who don't know Christ. Which net are you in? Which basket would you be placed in if the line was drawn this morning? If the shout of heaven was given and the righteous were taken out in the rapture, would you be here to turn out the lights? Or would you be gone? Would you be in that day of judgment, wheat or tares? Would you hear Christ say to you, come, come on, come and inherit it. I've been preparing it for you, come on. I've not, I've not missed a single thing that's happened in your life, come on. Or would you hear him say, depart, not you, depart, depart. Would you try to argue with God at that point? But I, I did some good stuff. Didn't you, don't, don't I get any credit? I went to Faith Fellowship and listened to Brother Tony. He preaches long. <laughs> don't I get any credit? <laughs> Listen to me. Not a bit. Because none of it yeah. removes the sin that separates you from holy God. But here again, the imitation, the Spirit of God, the life and words of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the song of the church say, come, come while it's day. Come now and receive Him and receive everlasting life. Come now and settle forever the living of these days and the eternities Issue, eternity's issue. Will you live for this dot or will you live for the line? The line says, the line demands come now and be saved. Let's pray about it.